So hello everybody, um, my name is Bruce Lowry, I'm part of the Skoll Foundation team. Uh, I'm excited to welcome you to this Skoll World Forum session on supporting global vaccine equity. Uh, this year the forum's theme is closing the distance and we thought there was no better way to reflect that than to invite our global network to design and build this event together. And this is one of the sessions that's a result of that. A few quick things before we begin. Um, this session is being recorded and will be re-released publicly after the event. Um, you know, feel free to use the chat uh, to engage with each other and ask questions of the speakers. Uh, this session is scheduled for 90 minutes. Um, after the session, as you probably had from other sessions, um, we will have a poll over in the right-hand column that we would love you to take uh, on your hopping screen. And on social media, we are using the hashtag um, SkullWF, and we would love for you to do the same. And uh, we're very thrilled to be able to include this session in the virtual Skull World Forum and want to extend a special thank you to Project ECHO for proposing and designing this session. And with that, I'd like to introduce and pass it over to Fred DeSam Lazaro of PBS. Thanks so much, Bruce. And greetings, everyone, wherever in the world this finds you. I am in Minnesota, uh, the heart of the United States, where some of you may know we're grappling with some vexing issues of race and policing right about now, but also a concerning uptick in COVID infections. This country, of course, remains number one in the world for COVID infections and deaths, but we're approaching a phase where available vaccines will outnumber available or willing arms. A New York Times article this week just noted noted that Mississippi, the poorest state in this country, had some 73,000 surplus dosages of COVID vaccines. Globally, the vast majority of people in low resource countries will not be vac vaccinated this year or next year. Will they ever be? I suspect we'll delve into, into this with our panelists and also about what it might mean given the daily headlines we hear about variants and less frequent headlines about population or herd immunity. The vaccines online and in the pipeline today draw headlines as much for the inequity of their distribution as for the spectacular and swift biomedical advance that they represent. An article in the New England Journal of Medicine called Vaccine Nationalism, ineffective, short-sighted, and deadly. I suspect many in this group might add the adjective predictable. Have we fallen into the moral catastrophe predicted by Dr. Tedros at the World Health Organization? And then we must contend with hesitancy for myriad reasons, depending on where you're looking. We've seen com confused guidance at times on travel, on masks, on vaccinations for pregnant women, all understandable given a virus whose first name is novel. Yet in a politically polarized time, this has been fodder for rumors and conspiracy theories and the vast exchange of ignorance that we find on our social media. Amid all of this confusion, we have a panel of clear-headed thinkers today to weigh in, who come at the issue from very different perspectives and who promise a realistic but solutions-oriented discussion on how we reconcile with the ground realities that we're dealing with in pursuit of closing the distance, the theme of this conference. Their bios are online and I urge you to, to uh, follow and read them. Quite likely they're not strangers to many of you in the audience. I'll therefore skip the introductions in hopes that we can use the time for questions and engagement um, on the panel live. I want to begin with a very brief round of opening reflections from each panelist. And uh, I was going to start with uh, Dr. Somia Swaminathan. Uh, is she here with us? This is down to the wire. Dr. Swaminathan, if you're here today, do we know that yet? Sanjeev, are you, are you checking? I guess. I think uh, so far, um, I don't see any sign of her other than the organizer. She's on. Oh, there oh, she is. Okay. Absolutely wonderful timing. Dr. Swaminathan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Do you hear me? 
Indeed, yes. and welcome. Just in the nick of time, I was just talking about you as it turns out. Oh, God. Introduction. Um, and we were going to go. We were going to go to you first. I'll get to settle in there. Um, Dr. Somia Swaminathan is the chief scientist at the World Health Organization and probably the, the freshest source of pandemic data. So I'll throw it to you for a couple of minutes. We're going to start with reflections from each of the panelists for two to three minutes before we mix it up a little bit. Uh, can you give us a snapshot today of where we stand in terms of the pandemic, the trajectory overall, any headline that we should be aware of today? Yes, so um, thanks very much, Fred. And um, we are not in a good place. We're not where we want to be or wanted to be uh, 16 months into the pandemic. We have, uh, for the last six weeks or so, consistently seen increasing uh, cases. We had, I think, uh, over half a million new cases today. And the average has been four to five million cases a week over the last several weeks and about 10,000 deaths a day. Um, this is going up and down a little bit. But what we see today is uh, increasing cases in almost every WHO region. As you know, we have six regions. And, um, and, and in some of the larger countries, we are seeing increasing transmission. In terms of the variants, there are three new variants of concern that, you know, the WHO now has definitions on what a variant of interest is and what's a variant of concern. A variant of concern is... Uh, uh, one that has mutations that either make the virus more transmissible or more resistant to therapeutics and vaccines. There are three variants of concern, but several others which are under evaluation. And uh, it is likely that many of those, including some that are circulating in India, for example, could be uh, classified as variants of, uh, of concern. And uh, the fact that they are more transmissible means that the public health measures that one needs to keep things in control has to be even more strictly applied. In terms of vaccines, of course, we uh, have seen now we are uh, over 100 days since the first vaccination program started. And uh, the good news is that there are so many vaccines that are proven to be safe and effective, at least 11 that are currently being used, but another 80 or so in clinical development. So that's the really good news and this is where science is really delivered um, and we've had new platforms like the mrna platforms and the adenoviral vector platforms that have never been used at the scale that have now proven uh, that they can be used and they are very safe and effective now the downside of course is uh, on the equity uh, agenda we haven't done that well of the 800 million doses of vaccine that have been that have been given to people around the world, about over 75% are in 10 countries. And in fact, a quarter of all vaccines in just one country. Um, these countries are mostly upper, upper income, uh, high income and upper middle income countries. And in uh, large, many countries in Africa, for example, uh, less than 0.2% of the population is vaccinated. So there's a 124 difference between the proportion of populations that are getting vaccinated in many, not in many, but in a few countries now, 50% of the adult population has been covered and in many, many, many other countries, less than 1% has been covered. So there's a big discrepancy, which means many vulnerable people are not being vaccinated. And so the risk is that if we allow things to continue like this, there's pandemic fatigue. There are many reasons why people are not following, uh, are not able to adhere to the same strict, you know, self-restrictions as well as government actions that were done in 2020. We see in 2021 a general relaxation uh, with, with at the same time variants are increasing and spreading. Vaccines are not reaching everyone fast enough to achieve herd immunity. And so we are creating an opportunity for the virus to continue to replicate, to continue to mutate, to continue to transmit, infect and kill people. So I'm sorry to have started on a very, uh, uh, not a very optimistic note, but as I said, that there are good things that have happened, which is that we have diagnostics, we have vaccines, we have a few promising therapeutics as well. But on the downside, uh, we are very far away from controlling this pandemic, let alone eliminating it. Okay. Well, thanks so much for that, Somia. We uh, 
needed that scene setter, uh, you know, for what it is. It's the it's the reality, and we'll uh, continue to uh, to come back to it. I suspect uh, in addressing it at various levels and from various perspectives. I want to go next to Sana Wendes at Covax, um, who is uh, you know looking at this very context that you're dealing with of the uh, and just a huge tall order. First of all, talk a little bit about what COVAX is, what it was intended to do, and give us a snapshot, a status report, if you will, Sana. Great. Thank you very much, and, and good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. Very happy to be part of this panel. Um, and thank you, Sumia, as well, for giving us that introduction. I know you can hear quite well about the situation that we're, we're globally dealing with. Sana, we can't hear you. You can't hear me? No. That's uh, a little better. Can you speak louder and a little... Yeah, please. Okay, I'm trying again. Is that better? Better. Keep talking. I think you're okay. Okay, good. I'll try again. All right, thank you. So what I wanted to share with you, and I won't share slides because I think it might be more helpful if we just talk this through, is what COVAX is. And so COVAX is um, a, a new global health partnership, I was about to say, between a number of international agencies that really came together last year to say, one world protected means that we all were stronger together than we are apart. And a number of the international agencies working in health needed to come together and bring our expertise to bear to be able to kind of collectively face the situation. So COVAX is the partnership of different organizations for the Gavi Alliance is the one that, uh, that, um, that I am part of, which is the Global Alliance, Vaccine Alliance, together with the World Health Organization, with UNICEF, with CEPI, an organization that uh, invests in research and development for epidemic preparedness, together with, um, with the, um, the PAHO organization as well, and the multilateral development banks came together, united our forces to be able to face the situation and gave ourselves the goal of trying to end the acute phase of the pandemic by 2021. And what does this mean? This means that we want to deliver 2 billion doses of vaccines globally in a fair and equitable manner to all of the participants that have signed up to be part of COVAX. COVAX covers 190 participants across the globe, of which 92 of these countries are countries that need financial support for the doses um, that benefit from what we call an advanced market. Um, we have uh, the largest uh, actively managed portfolio of vaccines in the COVAX portfolio as well. Um, and we use that to be able to invest in. So the COVAX facility, which really hasn't existed for that long, has been able to mobilize $6.3 billion since the, the, since, uh, the summer um, to be able to finance doses um, to these countries that need the financial support. We have currently signed deals with seven vaccine manufacturers and we've secured access to 2.3 billion doses of vaccines, um, which are either secured or in negotiation for 2021. Now, turning that picture to say, so how much have we actually delivered? And going to some of the numbers that Sumia was speaking about in terms of where the where um, vaccines are being delivered in the world, um, COVAX has been able to deliver close to 40 million doses of vaccines to 107 of these 190. So um, we were able to develop um, to to deliver and out of those 38 million or close to 39 million, 32 million of those are for these countries, for 61 countries that are lower income countries or lower middle income countries. The first delivery that was through COVAX was to Ghana, and that was in late February, and that happened 80 days after the first global vaccination program to and started elsewhere. So that time span was shorter than what we've seen in other pandemics. However, that's not quick enough, and we all realize that we do need to do much more than that. We've been able to, in 42 days from that first introduction, to introduce and deliver in 107 countries all in all. all, in all. However, the quantities are still low and nowhere near the goals that we set ourselves. And we have very, very large inequities between the vaccination rollout in many countries. Some countries having not received any vaccines yet. Others are being at the rate of having uh, 
uh, globally having vaccinated um, uh, a very large portion of their population. So huge inequities still um, exist. And that's something that we're actively looking towards. And so the COVAX facility has this portfolio and is foreseeing um, these vaccinations being able to be rolled out very much from now on until the end of the year. So this supply of up to 2 billion doses is really taking off from June on um, until the end of the, of the year. So we're very, very hopeful that we will work with, uh, with countries to be able to roll these out. I do want to speak just one second about some of the complexities that we've all heard about in the media around the delays that we see in supply and some of these unforeseen delays. And we're seeing those in COVAX as well, like all countries are seeing them. And so we have, we've planned that we will be able to get shipments and to be able to have these deliveries, but we're realizing that there are a number of challenges. These vaccines are quite complex and they're, they're produced um, and, and put together from uh, components from different countries as well, which require regulatory approval from all of these different countries. So a very large complexity that's very time consuming. Manufacturers are scaling up at a rate that has never been seen before as well. And that also implies a certain number of, uh, of manufacturing delays that we also need to take into account. And finally, countries need to be ready to be able to achieve these doses to have import licenses to be able to, to accept them as well as a number of other uh, barriers, which means that while we want to have very ambitious timelines, we're working within ranges of unforeseen delays that we have to take into account. Um, and I thought that would be a helpful way to kind of frame some of the discussions and the inequities that we will be seeing. It's going to be a bumpy road um, in the coming months, but one that we're very Okay, thanks so much, Sana. And we've got a message coming to you on the chat as well about uh, audio in hopes that we can clarify your audio a little bit better. Um, I want to go next to Dr. Nahid Badilia, who is uh, joining us from Boston. Um, you have uh, boot on the ground experience with Ebola in West Africa. You've done a lot of work in infectious diseases. Uh, and I'm just wondering, as you see what you've just heard in terms of the context and the way things are laying out. I mean, is some of this ringing familiar? And uh, what needs to, what's happening, what's not happening in your mind? What are the priorities that we should be looking at right now? Fred, thanks so much. And, you know, I, I kind of wanted to, as you said, take that granular view because I've, aside from working on emerging infectious diseases, I've been a frontline healthcare worker, both in multiple Ebola outbreaks, but also now with COVID. Um, and, and you're right there are echoes. And, and what I wanted to be granular about is why the work of COVAX, why, why this vaccine equity is important. Um, and I wanna start by just talking about the fact that the speed at which we, we achieve coverage of vaccines and vaccine equity is important. Um, one, because the longer we, we see high numbers of cases of COVID-19, you're looking at particularly, you know, uh, healthcare systems in low resource areas become overwhelmed by cases, become overwhelmed uh, by hospitalizations, and, and that's taking away from potential care for other endemic diseases. And so the secondary ripple is much larger. But beyond that, the impact on healthcare workers we don't have a handle on how many healthcare workers have actually become infected or have died from COVID-19, but I can imagine that number is in many thousands, and that's taking a workforce away from many resource-limited countries that could be employed in providing care um, to all the other existing sort of medical conditions and challenges. And But beyond that, you know, let me also speak as a healthcare worker who has been part of multiple crises and outbreaks. There is something that there is an immense psychological impact on healthcare workers the longer they e exist and operate in crisis standards, in, in crisis situations, you know, the daily triaging. And the longer our healthcare workers around the world have to face the situation, the shorter their resilience will become. And so getting those vaccines to healthcare workers is going to help their health, but also it's going to help recovery of healthcare systems mm -hmm. and, and also protect our healthcare workers from that long-term psychological damage that we saw certainly for many, you know, Ebola responders, but you really, you are seeing it in many crises as healthcare workers are coming out of it. So, so first, speed is important to equity. Second, vaccines are necessary, 
but they are part of a larger toolbox in what we've, and I know Sanjeev is going to talk about what is needed to get the vaccines in the last mile, but I want to talk a little bit about community engagement. And we saw this. Um, so I've worked uh, both in East Africa and West Africa, and most recently, you know, uh, I've been in Uganda for the 2018 DRC outbreak with the rollout of the Mark Ebola vaccine. And I can tell you that having a vaccine that's effective is one part of getting vaccine hesitancy, addressing vaccine hesitancy takes community engagement. It takes long-term engagement, particularly around a medical countermeasure or a vaccine uh, that is that is relatively new on the market, even though it has a safety profile. And particularly with COVID, I think you're seeing so much disinformation and misinformation that I foresee uh, for uh, this being a challenge, even as, as the number of doses of vaccines increase. The last thing that I want to talk about is, you know, we're, we as, as a world, you know, go through, as you've previously heard, cycles of panic and neglect. We're very good at responding to crisis. We, we go in, we respond to a crisis. We're getting slightly better at preparedness. You know, now we've been talking about building this infrastructure and I think COVAX, uh, utilities like COVAX are going to bring the platform together to help us address the next crisis. We don't talk as much about the long tail. I can tell you my experience in West Africa with the uh, in Sierra Leone with the the West African virus Ebola virus disease epidemic. When the cases of Ebola receded, we started seeing outbreaks of measles because what you saw was childhood vaccination rates had gone down. You started seeing other health indicators get worse, and as we come out of this pandemic. The secondary impacts, you know, on on health indicators, on economic indicators, on childhood mortality, on you know, on on women's empowerment. We have a lot of work ahead of us. In fact, there are studies, for example, IMF had a report that said in the five years leading after any major epidemic, you see income inequality get worse. And, and we know that it's not just the inequality that gets worse, but if we don't achieve vaccine equity, that is huge economic impacts for the whole global GDP. There is a RAND Europe report in December that talked about the fact that if we don't achieve that vaccine equity, uh, the global GDP will lose about $1 trillion. And so it's people's lives, it's people's health, it's the economy. And so we can, we can ensure vaccine equity in terms of numbers of vaccines, but to achieve true equity is to build resilience and stick around to help with the long tail in many of the countries that have been heavily affected. Um, so that's that's really what I wanted to reflect on. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, and finally, rounding up this introductory segment and uh, and setting the stage for, you know, for engaging in the myriad issues that we're dealing with, Dr. Sanjeev Aurora with Project ECHO, you've uh, scaled massively and globally uh, in, in your footprint and have become expert at uh, focusing on building up uh, know-how essentially and skills you know, for delivery in the last mile. So take it away, Sanjeev, and tell us more about how this applies to the vaccine rollout when that happens. Well, thank you, Fred. and. Um... Uh, first of all, uh, foremost, from our team at ECHO, I want to thank uh, you for moderating this session, Soumya, Sane, and uh, Nahid for accepting our invitation. Uh, very grateful. Um, I think the disparity in the world exists in two broad domains. The first is certainly lack of resources, in this case, lack of vaccine. But there is another a source of disparity, and that is lack of knowledge, and we know that the lack of the right knowledge at the right place at the right time can be fatal because you can't get the right care at the right place at the right time without the right knowledge. An example is 1,800 children die every day of diarrhea when we know that oral rehydration and simple antibiotics that Nahid could prescribe could save their lives, but that knowledge doesn't exist. ECHO is a platform to build human networks. We use technology to build human networks to democratize the implementation of best practices around the world. And the mechanism is to create communities of practice where local experts are working, solving local problems, whether they relate to logistics or they relate uh, to cold storage or they um, deal with local prioritization of resources or training vaccination workforce, etc. Before COVID-19, uh, ECHO was um, running about 800 global networks. Uh, we had about 220,000 mentees in um, 
150 countries. It's a hub and spoke model. But in 2020, as COVID-19 came along, what ECHO did is it transformed all its networks, literally 90% of its networks to be COVID response networks in every part of the globe. And it started with simple things like infection control, how to reuse PPE, how to protect yourself, how to create an inpatient floor for COVID-19, how to protect a nursing home resident, and moved on later to how to use dexamethasone, how to ventilate patients on their stomach or on the backs. And, um, and now the use of antibodies, uh, mostly in the developed world. But most recently, our work um, involves partnerships with the US government, with the CD Center for Disease Control, Global Division, Africa CDC, WHO, AFRO. And in 2020 alone, 1.3 million learners around the world in 179 countries are, are participating in ECHO projects with the idea to democratize the knowledge of global agencies like WHO, but local experts customizing that knowledge to local communities. And my, I want to invite all our listeners today that if they have an interest in using our model, we don't charge for uh, partnering with people and we uh, provide our platform and technical assistance at no cost to our partners who are interested in the idea of democratizing uh, vaccine equity in this world. Also, the most important focus for us right now is building vaccine confidence, Fred, because one of the challenges that's happening with all the news items that are coming out about these strokes, you know, I left India in 1980 and came to the United States. And in the last few weeks, I have received more calls from people from India asking, should I take the AstraZeneca vaccine or not? And I think the vaccine confidence is being undermined seriously. And dissemination of science-based information is so critical to have the confidence to have vaccine equity in the world. And thank you. Over to you, Fred. Excellent. Thank you. We're starting to see the flow of questions coming in uh, from the audience, and we'll get right into it. Uh, the first thing that springs to mind are some of the numbers that we got in the synopsis you laid out, Sana about COVAX and uh, one of our audience uh, just weighed in to say that might get us to 20% in low and middle income countries. And uh, those numbers are stark for, their, uh, for the scarcity they represent. And I just would like uh, both you and, and Somia to address um, what that means overall. Maybe if I can, uh, I can jump in and say, that's correct. That the, the, when, when we started out on this as well, when, when the, uh, the ambition was set um, during last year for the for the twenty percent, it was based on the assumptions of, of the supply that would be available at a global level at that point in time. But it was also the twenty percent was based on um, on the number of healthcare workers at risk populations and realizing that those were the populations that we had uh, a, a responsibility to have vaccinated as quickly as, as possible. And by the way, I hope my audio has been resolved, so I hope that that's better. Okay, I'll, I'll try to speak. Um, the other thing is that we are in the COVAX partnership as well in the COVAX pillar more broadly, asking ourselves the question exactly these days, which is what is our level of ambition going forward? What do we, what do we foresee when we have, uh, when we have reached these 20% through COVAX as well, how do we make sure that we support countries to get them to uh, uh, their ambition levels as well? So these discussions are really ongoing as we're currently trying to roll out um, these, va these vaccines um, at this stage uh, right now. Um, so those are some of the initial comments. Uh, I'm sure Sumia as well would uh, have things to add on. Sumia? Uh, Sana, it's very hard to hear you. Did you follow the instructions that they gave you on the chat? Yeah, okay. Um, so maybe just to reiterate what she said, <clears throat> it's not, I think it's, uh, it's a mis, 
conception that the COVAX facility is set up to cover 20% of the needs of uh, developing countries. It's not true. 20% is the floor, it's not the ceiling. The floor we set because we said that's the bare minimum that we need to achieve in the shortest time possible. And that is by the end of 2021. And the 20% came by looking at what proportion of people are frontline and healthcare workers on an average about 3% of a country's population, it varies. And then you look at the other vulnerable groups, the elderly. Now, again, if you look at Africa and you look at some of the European countries, there's a big difference in the population of people over the age of 60. In Africa, that may not be the biggest group, but it may be other people who are uh, at risk because they have underlying conditions that make them more vulnerable. So that could vary from country to country and region to region, but it would be about 15 to 17% of the population. So that's how we got to the 20% which need to be urgently protected. And the idea was that you need to start with covering at least 20% of every country in the world so that you're actually protecting those, reducing the deaths and the unnecessary infections and also protecting the health systems. Because if health workers start getting infected and dying or having to take leave and be away from work, then in many countries, it's, it's very difficult to maintain any kind of essential health services. And we've already seen huge impacts on essential health services. And as Nahid was saying, I think we still haven't really uh, faced up or counted or measured the impact of the pandemic. What we are counting and measuring are the in COVID infections and deaths, and that too, you know, we're only capturing a, a, a proportion of them. We know that in many countries, because of the lack of diagnostics, that the, the ratio between the detected and the actual infections in the community could be anywhere from 20 to 40 times more. So, and, and same with deaths. A few studies done in a few African countries have shown uh, that there has been, you know, significant undercounting of deaths. But that's just COVID. Then there's all the other impact that people uh, with non-communicable diseases, tuberculosis, HIV, um, have not been able to access health services. So I think the impact of the pandemic, and then we're not even talking yet about the impact on women, on children, on education, on, on livelihoods, on uh, nutritional indicators, and all of that. So this is going to be a very big impact. So this is why we need to control it as soon as possible. And that's uh, the, I, the goal, of course, now we're looking at what are the possible future scenarios. So like Sane was saying, in, in, in the, for the COVAX, we have to plan. So we've already planned for 21, that we, we need to get the you know, minimum two, 2 billion doses out, cover 20% of the population, but then 2022 and beyond, what's the ambition? A lot depends on what's going to happen, what the virus does and what we do. But the idea, of course, is that we should control it and contain it till it's not uh, an infection that's causing huge uh, morbidity and mortality. And for that, we think that you're going to need herd immunity, which means protecting at least 70 to 80 percent of the population. Uh, the question of children is still open at the moment. Clinical trials are going on, but eventually, I think already high income countries are planning to vaccinate children um, and they're already uh, either with the same vaccine or with a variant vaccine. Whereas, so that's where the, this becomes very difficult because we're trying to get vaccines out to these uh, AMC 92 countries um, while uh, there are a lot of excess doses. So we've proposed that there could be several short-term measures. One is that countries that have covered 20 to 30% of their population now donate excess doses that they have to the COVAX facility. So we can ramp up in other places. The other is to really look at how we can improve the supplies by increasing the number of tech transfers that are happening, you know, both voluntary licensing, other kinds of um, uh, transfer of knowledge and know-how. And, and of course, the WHO DG has very uh, repeatedly supported the call uh, that India and South Africa have put into the World Trade Organization for the lifting of all IP restrictions related to COVID vaccines and other technologies. And we set up the COVID technology access pool last year for sharing of, of knowledge and know-how. Um, so, 
so there is a lot of ambition but uh, we we still have to uh, well you need global collaboration and solidarity uh, to to make these things happen and i think we we have done better in this pandemic than we've done in previous pandemics okay. but we need to do much better a lot to unpack there so let me try and and start based on some of the questions that that provokes and questions that have come in online uh, the numbers you cite uh, that are realistic in an epidemiological context sound uh, you know, to a, to a non-medical person, a public health person, almost meaningless if you're talking about variants and controlling the spread. Can you talk a little bit about what's at stake with all of the variants that you've cited earlier? If, you know, a stretch goal, which won't be met in 2021, is 2 billion dosages. And I'd love for Nahid to weigh in on this as well. I mean, what are we talking about in terms of the epidemiological consequences of what is your ground reality today, which is when you're nowhere near the goals, the very modest okay. goals. Yeah, I'm sure Nahid would come in. I, you know, epidemiologically, the risk here, of course, is that um, you're not being able to vaccinate people in, in significant numbers to reduce, uh, you know, transmission, then you are allowing the virus to do what it does naturally. I mean, it's a natural evolution of the virus to mutate and it acquires mutations. All viruses do that. Most mutations don't mean anything. They don't have any impact on the virus. Some mutations will actually be detrimental to the virus because they, they don't offer any advantage. In fact, they offer disadvantages. So that means a virus dies out. But then the risk is that they accumulate mutations which actually enable it to transmit more efficiently. That's what it's doing now. The same, we see the same mutation appearing in different parts of the world at the same time. So there are certain, and there many of them are in the spike protein of the virus, which is the one that binds to the human cell. So it's trying to escape any kind of immune response that it is producing. And the danger is that some of these may actually uh, also be able to escape the vaccine-induced immunity. In, in, in addition to natural immunity. So they could reinfect people who've been infected before and they could also infect people who've been vaccinated. Now, till this, up to now, the reinfections have been quite rare. So that's a good thing. It shows that the immune response to the first infection is quite robust. And in the majority of people, it does protect you from a second infection for at least, you know, eight, nine months. I mean, that's the duration of follow-up we have now let's say a year. Um, vaccines, mixed results. Some strains, some variants like the South African, the B1351 and the P1 variant in Brazil, and now the variant described in India as also similar mutations, are able to resist the antibodies. So you need higher levels of antibodies in the blood to overcome those viruses. So I think that's really the, uh, the big danger is that we allow this virus to continue to replicate in parts of the world. Some parts of the world are protecting their people. Those are going to be islands. But how can you, the, the world cannot get back to any kind of normal if you have a few islands and then you have all this rampant uh, viral uh, replication infection going on in other parts of the world. So that is why we need a global response to a pandemic. It cannot be a country by country response. It's going to work. Now, I had just to pick up on that, I mean, the political reality, the political imperatives in so many countries, especially rich ones, um, is to create islands. I mean, islands feel better in the immediate term. How do you get past that hurdle? Well, I think if anything, this pandemic and really all emerging pathogens over the last 20 years should tell you that there are no islands on on this globe and there's a marginal cost for both rich countries and poor countries for us to fall behind the evolution of this virus and that marginal cost is i mean you're already seeing moderna and pfizer for example and johnson just working on the boosters for um for these new variants moderna just declared that they potentially might have a booster ready in you know that would be six months after the primary series so there's a marginal cost, the actual cost of taking a vaccination that's developed and getting it into people's arms. The longer this virus evolves, 
the, the more boosters, the, the more vaccinations that need to occur, and that's an investment on the part of health systems, both both in um, you know high income countries as well as low and and middle income countries, because that is that is the cost, right? It, it is redoing those vaccinations as these new variants come out, and so so that's that's one part of it. But, but I, I, I there is some hope that we are we know that at least now, as Dr. Swaminathan said. Part of the reason this year was so dangerous is because none of us were immune to this virus. It was brand new. And and once we get at least this primary vaccine series into most people, it's going to create a floor to the point where there will be some protection, even as these new variants grow. And and and, and the thought is that even though the data currently is about six months, most people would agree that protection against the wild type and, and some level of protection against the variants probably lasts much longer than that. We don't yet know, but it's at least six months. And, and so we're looking at uh, still aiming to get this primary you know, series in everybody. Uh, but I, I wanted to stress that, that they can't, I think, people who are making policies, this political stem in high resource countries, it needs to focus on the fact that there is a selfish reason to do this, and there is the humanitarian reason to do this. And the selfish reason to do this is that it will continue to cost us money, continue to cost us other marginal costs to our healthcare system, uh, particularly when our therapeutics don't work as well. We know monoclonal antibodies might be affected by some of the variants that currently exist. And there was a lot of money that was put in development of those therapeutics. And so it, the, the, the fact that even if herd immunity is achieved, in high resource countries, there may be people who are not able to achieve a response to the vaccines who remain vulnerable. And hence, you know, having the, vac the, the virus continue to circulate and potentially not having this therapeutics has real health impact uh, for high, high, high income countries as well. Okay. Sanjeev, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the, uh, the task. We've talked conceptually about getting know-how um, to the last mile, but I mean, we're talking about a lot of very remote last miles, which have um, very uh, lacking infrastructures um, frequently. Talk about the scope, if you would, of the task ahead of um, organizations such as yours to get vaccines, you know, to the entire distance. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, Fred, first of all, um, as I was mentioning earlier, and there are many questions related to that, is vaccine confidence. You know, we have to make sure that people uh, in the communities, I've been reading statistics that in some African countries, only 30% of the people are willing to take the vaccine. And so when the vaccine is coming, and uh, the same is in some Latin American countries. And so building that confidence um, requires it requires much more listening than just talking. I think Dina Blackbinder make, makes this comment that some people are just not amenable to science-based information. And so a lot of ECHO's work involves uh, training other people, such as uh, church leaders. Uh, we know that having somebody from your own race giving you that advice is much more effective than in the United States uh, African-American doctor is much more persuasive for a black citizen than a, than a white uh, physician. So there has to be that type of awareness raised in the last mile, first on vaccine confidence, but when vaccine is not available on how to prevent the infection. And this has to come from trusted sources. The way we overcome the technology burden uh, is that <clears throat> In most parts of the world, they don't have the kind of landline connections, Fred, you have in your home where you have a Comcast line coming in. So mobile technologies, 3G, 4G, are how this information is transferred. And we create these local communities of practice. So there's a local expert in Nairobi who's running these uh, communities of practice and knowledge networks in Kenya who is who's is, who's is teaching these people how to how to convey the vaccine how to deliver the vaccine how to uh, also talking to them about how to build vaccine confidence and i do want to emphasize this one issue that you discussed earlier with with Samia and nahid is that any delay in the vaccination in these low income countries 
is there's almost certainly going to be, for example, we now have uh, the South African variant, the 135 variant, its, its sensitivity to the antibody is one seventh that of the, the, the native uh, variant. Yes, it does prevent serious infection, but when, when you look at the 484 variant, it basically uh, is going to have much more resistance. And the more, the longer we take, we are almost certainly going to develop new variants that are really not going to be, these vaccines will not work at all. And so this idea of uh, somehow uh, all of us getting together and overcoming these intellectual property barriers is critical along with this training uh, that I don't think we as ECHO are going to have difficulty in getting this knowledge to the last mile as long as the vaccine sort of follows, uh, follows pace with that. We've got two critical issues to discuss here. Number one, the political will of creating it or the realization that helping others is helping yourself, the self-interest to overcome the immediate political imperatives that drive uh, decisions in the in the rich world certainly and on the other end um, getting credible information to folks in partnership with religious uh, and all manner of things nothing here is particularly new uh, we've seen this this story before in in the polio campaigns uh, in northern Nigeria and Pakistan where there's a great deal of misinformation that is spread we're seeing it all across country where I'm sitting in the United States, uh, misinformation as it concerns COVID as well. So who wants to take a crack of what might be different this time uh, than it was, you know, on these fronts um, that we've seen historically, whether it's HIV, whether it's, it's, um, it's, um, you know, Ebola, whether it's, it's, it's polio. And, and Sana, I will come to you on what, what, what this does to, uh, to you. Uh, eventually, but who wants to take a crack at, you know, how we make things different this time uh, and make the record uh, sound different than we have had before? Maybe I can start, uh, Fred. Uh, the WHO did recognize early on that this was an issue, you know, as you said, historical experience tells us that if you don't do anything, then you're going to end up with an equitable uh, access problem. And that's why we, along with the other global health agencies and partners, set up the ACT Accelerator in April of last year, We're in fact, coming up to the one year anniversary. And the goals there were to firstly accelerate the development. So promote the R&D, facilitate and accelerate the development of new tools that's diagnostics, vaccines, et cetera, but also to ensure equitable and fair access to those tools. So from the beginning, it was a dual uh, track. Yes, you know, work with the private sector to, to get them to make these uh, innovation scale up, but then also in, uh, develop global frameworks for equitable access. And we worked on this fair allocation framework. All the 194 member states of WHO discussed it. And, and, and agreed and approved that that's th those are the principles, they were ethical principles based on which the allocation framework was developed. I think all of those are new through COVAX. Now there's a whole list of things that have happened globally for the first time, you know, from uh, this kind of a, a large pool procurement of, you know, several different vaccines to setting up uh, a global compensation fund for the low income countries uh, so that they don't have to struggle with the legal uh, challenges uh, because all these vaccines we knew would be used under emergency use listing and so on. So a lot of uh, new things happened. I think there's been tremendous collaboration between the different agencies. You know, they've worked together like never before. So there has been a common purpose. There has been a coming together. There has been quite a lot of political support and momentum and a lot of good intentions and declarations of equity. Sometimes, you know, you wonder if that is rhetoric and not turning into reality. But I do think compared to HIV or H1N1, uh, any of our, or even something simple like hepatitis B, where it took 30 years for hepatitis B vaccine 
to get introduced into a low-income country after it was introduced into high-income countries. Here, we took, I think, 45 days to get a vaccine into the low-income countries after it was in a high-income country. And that was purely because of uh, COVAX. So, as I said earlier, I think without COVAX, we without the act accelerator, we would be in a much more difficult situation now, I think. Uh, H1N1, I think ultimately what happened was that high income countries donated some leftover uh, vaccine because they had procured too much for their own needs. And then the pandemic turned out to be not a very serious pandemic. So then they were donating. But if it had turned out to be a really bad pandemic, there would have been no vaccines for the uh, large parts of the world. So I, I do think that uh, we've learned and we've, we've done tried to do things differently. But again, when it comes to things like sharing IP, sharing know-how, being willing to share excess doses of vaccines, that's not happening. And uh, that seems pretty clear. Uh, you know, eighteen billion dollars in subsidies, uh, notwithstanding, in the uh, in the COVID vaccine context, um, you have some very very a strong resistance to a TRIPS waiver um, that would allow it. Um, is that just something that's insurmountable? And, you know, two-part question to you, Dr. Swaminathan, is it insurmountable, A, and B, how much in reality would a TRIPS waiver um, expand production and availability of vaccines? So your second question first, that, uh what the experts say is that patents are not the main barrier to vaccine scale up. And, and that's true. But so, what we need to qualify is the TRIPS waiver will enable uh, you know, the technology transfer without having to go through country by country and company by company negotiations. So, I think it will be very helpful to have that. And as the DG often likes to say, if, if now is not the time, if you can't do it at the time of a pandemic, then when will be the right time. So the TRIPS waiver will then need to be followed up with a real willingness for companies that own the technology and know-how to share it, to train others, and, and to build capacity in other companies around the world. And that's a stream of work that we are now picking up. And we are hoping that we can, for example, use mRNA technology uh, and build technology transfer hubs where companies from the developing world, from the African continent, from Latin America, can, can get that technology and set up their own manufacturing, both to, to help end the COVID pandemic, but in the future, you know, obviously they will be then in a much better position to prepare vaccines for other diseases and for future pandemics. So I think that's the direction in which we need to go. And uh, it, it's a package of things. So it's, it is the IP waiver, the TRIPS waiver, but it has to be a company you No, know, because vaccine manufacturing is a complex process. It's much more complex than drugs. So generic companies can't just start doing it on their own. They don't have the know-how. Your first question, is it insurmountable? No, I think it just needs uh, the will and it needs is that that have these big companies to to be willing to do this um, it happened in the past in, in other ways right HIV it happened in a very different kind of a way but that was a long time ago and things are very different now so I think what we need is is for the high income countries that control a, a lot of the pharma big pharma uh, to be willing to go that extra mile during the pandemic. After all, this TRIPS waiver is only for, for this pandemic, uh, but it would really help solve the problem that, that we are facing now. Sana, how does this all ricochet in your world? We think of COVAX, when we think of COVAX at all, more in the context of procurement. Uh, what are some of the other complications such as those which we've just been hearing about? Sana? You're muted. 
Roxana, are you able to unmute? I don't, I think we, uh, let's see, headphones going on. And I'm really sorry about about being unable to hear you. You you appear to be muted. Are you able to unmute? You may not hear me. So, uh, Fred, as Sonic comes why back, yeah, I wanted sure. to reflect on the question that you asked Dr. Swaminathan about what will be different this time. And there is a study recognition that to battle emerging pathogens, you need to democratize the research capacity. You know, to to understand the full scope of how an emerging infectious disease plays out, what is this appearances presentation, to evaluate diagnostics and medical countermeasures, you need to have capacity in areas where those diseases may appear everywhere, but in particularly areas that don't currently have that capacity. And that was a recognition from, uh, from the West African vir Ebola virus disease epidemic. You saw successful completion of the, the, the Ebola vaccine trial in Guinea um, and, and how powerful that was as a tool in the next Ebola epidemic that occurred or outbreak that occurred um, in DRC soon after that. And so the, the, the experience we've had uh, now with WHO, for example, setting up efforts such as the solidarity trial that helped establish, you know, that research capacity um, to engage populations and researchers in many different countries. That is a win for, for the rest of the global community because it gets us closer to the answers of what works and what doesn't work. And it also is a great way to set up the platform for next time there's a threat that's on the, that's on the global forefront. I think Sonny. Sana, are you are you back? I can try. Am I back? Okay. <laughs> Do you remember the question? Did you even hear it? I heard it. I think I heard everything. I think you were speaking. And apologies for this. I think what are the challenges that we're seeing um, in terms of of the rollout? Was that correct, uh, Fred, or was that a yeah? Bit different? I mean, we, we think of uh, of Covax, you know, uh, in significant part, at least I do, as a procurement kind of agency is a clearinghouse, but um, I mean, what are some of the collateral things that we have to deal with based on some of the hurdles that we've been talking about, the, uh, the hesitancy, for example, um, and other kinds of infrastructural issues? Um, is that anything that's on your radar screen right now, or is it just getting the vaccines in the house for the most part? No, I think it definitely is, of course. I think our main challenge right now is getting vaccines out, and that is not a small endeavor. I think it, it needs to be realized that getting this many vaccines out is probably one of the largest logistical challenges that we have um, collectively in this space. Um, getting these vaccines out, they are vaccines that have a relatively short um, uh, shelf life. So we need to ensure that they're rolled out, sent out to the countries and used very quickly by those countries and that countries have the capacity to be able to roll those out, which means that this is something that the, that COVAX um, with its partners is working very much on. And, and we're, we're working very closely with, uh, with UNICEF particularly also on the delivery of all of these vaccines um, to the countries. So I think that's one of the larger challenges that we're seeing. We're of course seeing that as I spoke about in the just earlier on that we're seeing a lot of challenges on supply right now. So the supply both being from, can we ramp up the supply by the manufacturers quickly enough, but also seeing the fact that some countries are in the, uh, in the situations where they have in their own countries, those that are manufacturing the vaccines, very high um, uh, disease burdens. And therefore that is also constricting um, the supply of doses that are going into COVAX um, because that, that there's a question of how and how to use these vaccines that we have um, 
most effectively or by by the different i think you were speaking to it before fred in terms of the vaccine nationalism that's definitely something that we see that's affecting the global supply as well so these are issues of course we're also seeing the issues that are coming up in some countries around the the safety issues that are affecting vaccine hesitancy um, and that we are, we're at COVAX relying on and really advocating for countries to follow the WHO guidance in terms of the use of the vaccines. But I think uh, as others, as I think Sanjeev and, and Nahid probably are more close to in countries, and as I've seen some of the comments in the chat, the question of how that actually affects people and their hesitancy towards vaccines is something that definitely is on the top of our minds as well so that we wanna make sure that we're using the vaccines we have most effectively and don't end up in a situation where we'll have doses we won't be able to, um, to get out um, and to use most effectively. Thanks. So the, the notion of countries uh, donating excess um, is not something that's more immediately on your priority uh, list. Because, no, it is. Uh, it, it definitely is. is. It's something that's very close to us. And I think uh, Sumia, um, yeah, as one of the COVAX partners as well, was speaking about this just earlier. It's something we're advocating very much for and that we see as a potential for getting um, extra doses into um, in through COVAX that we would be able to work. So we're, we're actively working with different countries on what that could look like. It sounds very simple that you could just move doses from one country to another or from one deal to another. And unfortunately, it's not not as simple as that. There are a lot of legal barriers and a lot of barriers around the contracts that we're working through to definitely find solutions for that because we think that this is really one of the ways that we can help ensure a more equitable access to these doses. How much uh, of a difference quantitatively would that make and how is it going? How are these negotiations going, generally speaking? So they're going well. It's too early for me to be able to give um, examples of them, I think, and hope that there will be um, there will be public statements around um, some of these doses um, coming in the near future. But it's not I'm not in a place to be able to say how many they are. I think we've seen um, and, and it has been in the press that there are many countries that really have um, more doses than their, their populations and sometimes several times more doses than their own populations. And, uh, and these are definitely some of the countries that we are engaging with to try to see whether or not those could be distributed um, through, uh, through the facility to be able to, to, to give access to other countries that don't have access to the same levels of bilateral deals. In the, in the final half hour of our, or so of our panel, you know, I'd like to go soon to uh, the whole notion of what this is teaching us in preparation for the next pandemic, which seems odd to speak about when we barely worked our way through this one. But I'm just wondering, uh, Sanjeev, if you can talk a little more about the collateral damage that we're witnessing right now. I know Nahid had made reference to it. Um, what are we looking at and how does that fit into the overall public health context in a world that is so preoccupied with uh, with treating uh, COVID? So I think, Fred, the collateral damage uh, obviously is in many frames. Uh, one is that there are a lot of other chronic diseases in the world like HIV, TB, which were the common problems from which people were dying in the world. and. Uh, in more developed nations, colon cancer screening, breast cancer screening, we are seeing increase in diagnosis and deaths from these diseases in countries because they are not getting the appropriate care. As Somya mentioned, childhood vaccinations. There is a huge collateral damage from that. The second, I think, I think the idea that we are going to only give those vaccines that are excess in developed nations or countries to other countries, that in itself, there's a fundamental flaw in that logic. Because here's the thing. Now, let's look at India, for example, which is a very large vaccine manufacturer, which was supposed to be a part of the COVAX, you know, 2 billion doses. But every day, the cases in India are just exploding. They are doubling every few days. And now, all their original plans of excess vaccine going to some of these countries can get sabotaged. I think that 
the intellectual property rules of sharing, such as, you know, for example, right now, the, the, the critical issue is will the mRNA manufacturing sites be set up all over the world uh, from Pfizer, Moderna, or their licensees? And these intellectual property arrangements have to be worked out now in the middle of a pandemic. You know, we need to work these systems out for future pandemics today so that when there's a pandemic, some of the rules are different. I mean, I was just talking about the variants like 484 where the spike protein is changing. Things are evolving at warp speed here in terms of the virus and our ability to keep up with it. And if at that time we have to have all these negotiations of how intellectual property will be shared in the world, it, it really sets us back in a very significant way. So I, I think that we need a complete rethink of the infrastructure for pandemics, the global response systems that are required, the communication systems, the planning systems, the supply chains, uh, the intellectual property rules of engagement. And, and as uh, uh, Dr. Tedros has said, you know, not get, giving this, having only 0.2% of the African continent vaccinated, that's a moral catastrophe. And I, we don't want to go into this again and again. And I think we can do it differently if we plan appropriately, Fred. There was a comment that came in about the opacity or the lack of transparency in the contracts. Um, anyone can weigh in on this. Was this an opportunity lost when the government or governments were negotiating with pharmaceutical companies uh, as they launched into um, create, you know, making these vaccines? Was it an opportunity lost uh, as it concerns opening up intellectual property regimes, if you will. Could this have been different this time so that the negotiations would have allowed or the agreements would have allowed for essentially, you know, what we're seeking now in 90 countries, which is a trips waiver? I think, I think uh, the facts are that at the time those negotiations were going on, a promise was made by the government that the intellectual property would be preserved of these companies. But at the end of the day, you know, there is intellectual property has financial value. And, and, and the, the point being that, you know, you don't really need to deprive dollars. these companies of financial value. It is not necessary to deprive the inventing company of financial value. And it's not this or that it could be both they could accrue all the financial value and yet have a sharing mechanism uh, as long as we are thinking in a different way that we have to vaccinate the world immediately. Otherwise, this virus is always going to stay ahead of us without really compromising the principles of private investment, et cetera. I think both are easily possible, Fred, if uh, we reimagine this game a little bit, especially in view of a pandemic. Yeah, I, um, Fred, just to jump in here a little bit, I, I think the issue is that none of these none of these issues are new. I mean, these have been ongoing topics of how, and I, I want to echo what Sanjeev said, which is that what we really need is a reimagining of how countries are beholden to each other in the setting of a common existential threat, right? The the framework that you know we're operating on, the IHR, the revised IHR from 2005, it has limits. It doesn't help answer a lot of these questions. It provides this platform or what, you know, we should all be doing to keep this a safer world from new pathogens or, or pathogens that are a threat. But there's a lot of issues that have come up, right? And and so since then, this idea of, of benefit sharing, um, it's come up when you talk about sample sharing for influenza uh, samples, for example, and we have this platform, the, the the pandemic influenza preparedness platform that allows countries to to share strains of influenza um, and, and with an exchange of potentially have a platform that allows negotiation for benefit sharing to those countries. Right? And this has come up again for something called the Nagoya Protocol, which which sort of implies again of how how do countries 
that discover a pathogen within their borders that might be threatening, that are willing to share that information with everybody else in a timely manner, particularly those that are in low resource areas, how can they, you know, the create a field that, that allows that once they've shared that, that the benefits of the medical countermeasures, the vaccines that are created on the other side of that sharing, there is some equity in that. So it is is not simply, I think it's not simply just the humanitarian imperative, but there is an international sort of, you know, equity that combines it to access to samples, it combines it to access um, to, to information, early information. And so I, I think that it could be linked in that way. And I, I don't, I just think we keep punting the ball to the next pandemic, but this has been a question that's been, um, you know, on the international field for at least 20 years. Right. And, and my question, you know, uh, which I should have proceeded with the, um, you know, with, uh, with stating it more clearly, but I, you know, I was talking about the leverage that governments had at the onset of this pandemic. Uh, they paid eighteen billion dollars to uh, companies to develop these vaccines, and I'm just wondering whether they didn't leverage enough. Anybody want to take it beyond a yes or no? Or it looks as though you're saying yes. No, no, I, th I, think, I, th I think Sane has a comment. Please go ahead, Sane. No, I was just going to go in. I'm, I'm not sure I have a full answer to that one. I think that looking back retrospectively, yes, the governments could have probably leveraged this more. I think what this in, in a way makes me think of is I think we've seen a global collaboration at a level that we've never seen before, um, at a speed we've never seen before. I think the speed of innovation, the speed of... Uh, of approval of these vaccines, of the trials being done at the same time with the international funding, the leverage of the international funding that has gone into this has been unprecedented. And I think that's because this is a truly global pandemic. Some of the others that we've seen have been disproportionately affecting parts of the world that have not been inciting the same levels of support that we're seeing today because the as much or even more importantly, par large parts of the world in high income countries today. So it is leveraging a lot more of this. And I think when we when at COVAX, when we started out with this, we I think we had the hope that this global solidarity was going to push us even further and more broadly within that. We've seen now that the, the, the countries themselves have gone and done massive bilateral deals that they have, which, which is making it, to be very honest, it is making it very difficult for COVAX to negotiate the, the deals that we can get through COVAX when we are up against very large countries that have a, a different leveraging power. So I, I keep thinking that it's a balance between, I think we've learned a lot. I think we've come together in ways that we've never done, but that's not far enough. And if we are to be prepared for a next pandemic, we do need to change and collaborate more truly at a global level and not think so much about our own populations, but actually truly think about what do we need to cover globally. I think Sumia put it out very broadly that, you know, the, the ambition that we had on 20% was not to say we only need 20%, but if you reach globally 20%, you start bringing down the deaths, you start protecting our healthcare systems to be able to respond to that. And from there, we can collectively move on. But that's not the situation that we've we've come in um, today. So I think there there definitely will be learnings to to take forward there. Thank you. When do you think you'll reach twenty percent? Our our absolute goal is to reach twenty percent before the end of the year, of this year. But it it really truly depends on the supply. That as I mentioned before, we are seeing right now we're seeing um, substantial um, challenges in some of that supply. But we're working very hard to reach at least the 20% by the end of the year. Do you think that's realistic anymore, given all of the confounding factors that have emerged since you set that goal? Yes, I do think it is still. It's going to take a large push, and we're, we're pushing through that with all of our might and all of our blood, sweat, and tears, but I think it is still realistic. We're not ready to, to, to take down our hands and, and, and not um, move forward with that goal. I wonder if... Uh if best practices come to mind and, uh, and, uh, and certain countries and, you know, Vietnam comes to mind, um, Singapore and Taiwan, which are, smaller. but, uh, what have they done by way of testing? And, uh, uh, and is that an option for, for others? 
or has that train left the station? Nahid, Sanjeev? Sure, I think, I think there has been a recent analysis of, uh, of this issue. Um, and uh, some of you may have seen it that uh, the response to COVID-19 has been highly dependent on the type of government that you have. That democracies where there is individual freedoms are prioritized, the response has been significantly poorer than countries where they have prioritized societal benefit and have been able to impose rules which are, um, which are mandated on society. And I think that those kinds of rules, I, as, I mean, you know, being in uh, one of the leading journalists in the United States, you, you know what's going on with masks right now in the United States in the middle of a resurgence. So I think, I think definitely a lot of these things need rethinking. Uh, so it, it, you know, ultimately, Fred, your previous question, or could the government have done differently? If you start peeling this onion and say, what's the root cause of it? What's the root cause? The root cause is a fundamental understanding of how do we prioritize private interest? Okay. If we are going to prioritize private interest above all else, then what happens really is in the Affordable Care Act, President Obama had to negotiate away the pricing right for the federal government on pharmaceutical companies. And, and, and this just flows down and it goes down to not wearing masks. It ultimately is this balance between private interest and societal interest and how we balance that makes a huge difference how we respond to pandemic. And the other part of this layer is how do we prioritize national interest versus the interest of the earth. And, and um, if, if imagine that a, a meteor, a big meteor was heading towards the earth, would we then start negotiations on how, which nation will do what, under what circumstances and how fast can that move? Or are we going to do this work ahead of time that when there is this kind of pandemic that Nahid talked about, where there's a global threat, that we have a different sort of playbook for that. And I think that requires some discussion. Nahid, I think you would have to say something. Go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, if there was a meteor towards there, I'm sure 30% of the world's population would disagree with that assessment, even if they could see it in the sky. <laughs> but um, one thing that I wanted to say is, you know, there's two parts of this. One is what Sanjeev talked about, which I want to talk about in a second. But the first part that we've seen that improves readiness in countries, government's readiness in countries for pandemics is when they've encountered a similar threat before. And this was true when you look at West Africa, the threat from the Ebola virus disease epidemic. Why did you see DRC um, handle the epidemic, the outbreaks that they've had, uh, or Uganda or Rwanda that have seen viral hemorrhagic fever, you know, uh, clusters handle it with a lot more speed? It's because they had uh, an understanding of what was at stake and wh why it required that, you know, uh, quick action and, and more resources and where the resources were required. So that intellectual capital of having dealt with a particular threat plays a big role. And you see that in the, uh, the Pacific, Asia Pacific Rim countries as well. You know, I, I, after in 2015, I was actually working, I was a consultant to the Taiwanese CDC and I had a great conversation with a lot of the public health folks that were attending for many of the countries that were affected by the initial SARS epidemic. And they, what they spoke about is this cultural and institutional shift um, after SARS, which basically read, you know, led to updates of their healthcare systems, led to a population level understanding of, of what was at stake and what actions needed to be taken and what their importance was, and, and understanding at the political level of, of why those actions needed to be taken. And so it is, it is, it is both the types of governments, but it is, it is also prior experience with pathogens. It is, I think the one big thing that I, you know, I keep coming back to is, as an American, in this moment in, in time, uh, one of the most well-resourced countries in the world and, and how horrendously we've performed in this response, you know, at least in the first two thirds of this pandemic so far, 
part of how this played out was politics and pandemic response. And recently, the Biden administration actually uh, said they want to bring together a, a working group or uh, an initiative that looks into how politics can be peeled away um, from pandemic response, from public health response. And, and you saw that play out in, in pretty malignant ways from what, what the reports are that are coming out in terms of the impact of non-scientists on CDC guidelines in the middle of a once in a century pandemic, right? And so the, this idea that, that pol politics is always going to have some role, you know, this is this is all everything. A lot of the stuff we're talking about today is is driven by global politics, geopolitics and, and other aspects. But but the at least when it comes to sharing the data, at least when it comes to building population trust, I think one of the big things that needs to needs to happen for the next one is how we control disinformation or how we how we dispel disinformation and misinformation and how we build population uh, you know cohesion and action by sharing timely information in a time that the scientific knowledge itself is shifting and and at the same time do so while pulling politics out of it is going to be an important challenge any ideas anything that you've seen that gives you hope that uh, you know that science will come to the fore and in, in in a lot of the debate that we see you know in, in social media and a lot of you know amid all of the conspiracy theorization that's going on all of that stuff i mean uh, it sounds pretty daunting doesn't it it does and i don't think there's one answer i think it there's a it needs help from many different fields you know and, and i think um i can only speak from my field as being a public health person as a scientist a um, huge part of this is how we communicate with the public how we share scientific uncertainty how we work with the media to you know to, to dispel confusion where it exists um, but beyond that it's actually building greater understanding um, and edu science education in our populations and that's that's the first step right you've seen science education public education levels sort of um, suffer you know in, in many different countries in the US or rather many different states in the US and so rebuilding uh, scientific literacy and then working on communications, you know, the, the what is the best practices of communicating in the middle of, of a moving, fast moving pandemic um, is one way we can master those things. And, and how do we work with social media companies and others um, to address this disinformation? I think all of those are things that I see as low hanging, complex, but low hanging obvious fruits that we got to work on. I did want to just, um, as an aside, and I wanted to bring it up earlier, um, can anybody talk about the role of testing uh, for COVID? I mean, is that something that, uh, you know, is too late in many, you know, in many theaters of this pandemic, or is that still something uh, that needs to be attended to, you know, as presumably they're doing in a country like Vietnam, which is, you know, which has been able to insulate itself so well? Sanjay? Oh, sorry. Sanjay is going to say something. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think that one of the things, and I, I think um, Sumia said this rightfully up front, or maybe it was Nahida said, who said that, I don't remember, is vaccines are not going to solve all of this. I think what we really need within this is, is a range of tools. And we need not just a range of tools, but we need a range of behaviors as well. So what we've come together in, in, in what um, Sumia was talking about, which was the ACT Accelerator, which is around how do we accelerate access and development of the new tools? It's vaccines, it's diagnostics, and it's therapeutics. But that's not enough. We need health systems and we need oxygen and we need a lot of tools. But tools are not going to get us all the way. We need the behaviors. We need the trust. Um, and I think that for the moment, one of the most effective tools or many of the most effective tools we've seen has been PPE. It's been masks. It's been social distancing. It's been hygiene, hand washing. All of the things that we've known for years have been working are what we've been relying on um, up until now. So I think that there is, we do need to recognize that, uh, and, and while I'm coming from the vaccines part, and we think that the vaccines, of course, have a major role to play, the, the diagnostics are going to continue to be a very, very massive part of this. And I think we're, we're all seeing it now, even in the countries we're in, that you need to have, uh, you need to, for a very long time, I think, going to have to have a test before you get on a flight and have another test when you get off a flight. And it's, it's going to be an integrated part of our, our um, societies or our communities, I think, that we're going to be using testing more and more. So there's a lot of, of innovation happening there as well. Okay, we're getting uh, pretty close to the end. And I was going to ask each of our panelists to 
reflect on lessons learned and uh, and perhaps depart on a on a hopeful note. And you started us out right there, um, Sana. Anything more to add on that? Um, as we go around to the rest of us, Sumya Swaminathan had to leave, and we appreciate it. Uh, um, so it's just the three of you, and, and if you wanted to continue as you were, uh, Sana, you know, what else gives you a sense of hope that uh, there are lessons learned that will apply well to the next pandemic, or even to the retirement of this, is that what one does, uh, of this pandemic? <laughs> Yeah, so maybe I, I mean I, I think I'm I'm generally a person of the, the glass half full. I, I try and I I tend to see things hopefully in an optimistic manner. Um and so I do think that we'll make it out of this. I think that we I think there are a lot of learnings even be, beyond the question of vaccines and access and all of these things. I think there there's gonna be some ma massive shifts in the ways that we're operating, whether it's the ways that we're working or connecting, we're having a a, you know, uh, an international conference by whatever platform it is that we're having this on. I think there's a lot of things that are going to change in the way that we're connecting um, as people. Um, but that said, I think we all look forward to coming back. I think from a, and, and coming back and being physically um, together with friends and loved ones. I think besides that, I think what are we learning from it? I think from a global health professional perspective, I think we're learning that global health collaboration is more important than ever. And I think if this has taught us something, it is it's by working collectively together and relying on our expertises instead of maybe having a little turf war here and there about whose responsibility it is to do what. This has really shown me that collaboration can happen in more pragmatic ways than I've ever seen in my 20 plus you know, years of working in, in global health. This is absolutely a game changer. And I, I'm hopeful that we'll take that collaboration into the future as well. Thanks. Okay, Nayad Baidivya, you have the, uh, you have another minute yourself. So to, I, to wrap things up. yeah, I was gonna say the thing that's amazed me as an infectious diseases doc is how quickly we were able to go from getting the sequence of this virus to creating vaccines, testing their efficacy and getting those vaccines in the arms of people, which shows that with political commitment, with investment, we can move mountains when we want to. And science can sort of come through and the tools that we have, you know, the messenger RNA vaccines are potentially a really promising tool, not just for this pandemic, but in the future for, for new infectious diseases threats or existing infectious diseases threats that require um, you know, a new reevaluation, such as malaria. I know there is a candidate for an mRNA vaccine for malaria that's being looked at. But but the other part is, you know, my hope, and this is, I agree with Sana, I'm, I'm sort of in the glass half full uh, group, is that we all went through a unifying experience. The whole world, this entire globe of, of humans in their own border, within their own borders, went through a unifying experience. And I hope that that brings us closer together. Um, and, and we are a lot more patient and, and a lot more, um, able to relate to each other than we were before, before this. Okay. And finally, Sanjeev Aurora, thanks so much for bringing this together. Um, what, uh, what makes you sleep uh, better at night, if you will? You know, one thing that I, we know that vaccine, if, if only 20% of the vac, uh, world will be vaccinated in a year, it will take, and it takes 80% for herd immunity. It'll take a long time before we get many, many years, we're going to have this pandemic. But we have proven methodologies through workforce training of people for training the citizens on basic things like how to prevent infection, masks or hand washing or whatever else. There is so many things we can do. Um, it, I think there is hope here if we double down on dissemination of best practices and helping people adopt them and getting buy-in for the world that we don't have, we don't have to have 50 million people die. Um, there are other things we can do while the science is catching up. That's one thing. I do also believe that the world will be a better place in the end. I just feel a little sad that the price we'll have paid is, is very, very massive. And it's going to be paid by the poorest nations in the world. And that is going to be a moral failure for us. So uh, it's time for some spiritual reflection for the world of what really, what does it mean to live on this earth and, 
and uh, tackle problems together. And I think that could also be a positive. Okay, with the broadcaster's precision, I want to thank you for being here. We're out of time. Uh, please, if you're in the audience, follow these these eminent panelists. Um, they're easily available and found online. And take the poll before you leave. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you elsewhere at Skull World Forum, I hope.